Welcome to this episode of the NLN podcast, Nursing Edge Unscripted, The Surface Track, and thank you for joining us. This episode is entitled, The Depth and Breadth of Mentorship, Exploring Informal and Formal Connection. Today, we will talk with two special people, mother and daughter, about their professional growth in nursing, both together and individually, and how mentorship can serve as a key ingredient to create a meaningful and productive career in nursing. So first, let me welcome Dr. Susan Binden. Uh, Dr. Binden is the Associate Professor and the Associate Dean for Faculty Development at the University of Maryland School of Nursing in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Binden also directs the Institute for Educators and serves as the Program Director for the Teaching and Nursing and Health Professions Certificate. Dr. Binden, provides professional development for both clinical practice and academic healthcare professionals. Also joining us today, I'd like to welcome Dolly Binden. Dolly is currently uh, working as a bedside nurse in the intensive care unit at St. Joseph Hospital in Denver. She has a BA in Spanish language, a BS in microbiology, and a BSN from the University of Maryland School of Nursing in Baltimore. She is certified in progressive care nursing and cardiac medicine, and she currently serves as a charge nurse, preceptor, and clinical instructor for BSN students. So I just want to uh, extend a warm welcome. Thank you, Dolly and Susan, for joining us today. Really happy to be here. Great. So I want to just dive right into our conversation. Rachel and I are looking forward to this. Um, and this conversation today is super special to uh, us because we have this rare and unique uh, opportunity to talk with a mother and daughter, right? So Susan and Dolly, both nurses from a long line of family of nurses. So I want, we want to hear a little bit more about that. And additionally, Dolly is coming to us from the practice side, um, and Susan is really coming to us from the academic side. So we have these, this mother-daughter duo and this, uh, these perspectives that will come from in nursing from practice and academic, and, uh, which is a really important partnership in healthcare that Rachel and I talk about all the time. Uh, so we want to ask if you would share a little bit about your roles in your respective organizations, what is filling your cup right now professionally, and um, what are maybe some ways that you're partnering together? Well, uh, I certainly someday hope to have a CV as impressive as my mom's, but for now, <laughs> I work uh, as a bedside nurse in the ICU at St. Joseph's Hospital in Denver. Um, I've been there for a few years and have really enjoyed um, learning and growing in that role. Um, I think I really share my mom's love of teaching and learning, and I think what is filling my cup right now, what I really love the most is uh, working with new graduate nurses or student nurses. I uh, take a lot of students as a clinical instructor several times a year in the ICU. And that is just so exciting because they bring so much energy and openness and enthusiasm for nursing that um, I get to help foster. So I really love that. Um, and yeah, that's my, that's what I do. That is wonderful, Dolly. And what about you, Susan? What do you yeah, want to just, do these days? Just listening to Dolly, that fills my cup up because that's where I started a long, long time ago is with the students and I, I just loved it. And now my, my kind of loves have braided into this wonderful role. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Development at the University of Maryland School of Nursing. I've been there about 12 years and I get to teach and I get to coach and I get to help develop others. Um, and that's just a dream come true. It's the, I mean, uh, it's the first time that position's been made available at the school. So I'm really lucky to be in the right place at the right time, which is a big secret to my career, I think, too. But what fills my cup is, is exactly that, just seeing faculty kind of set a goal, figure out how to get there, meet that goal, and to be able to help them do that, facilitate that growth is just, is just thrilling. So I feel very lucky to be able to do that every day. Awesome. And um, I, I'm just excited about your role at the University of Maryland um, School of Nursing, because I know you've been 
doing aspects of that role informally for many years for all of us. And we spoke about that uh, with you, Rachel and I, last time we met. Um, just those hallway conversations, uh, the coaching, the, the guidance, the mentorship that you provide um, many people at the School of Nursing and beyond. Um, I know that including Dolly, obviously, um, following in your footsteps. Uh, so I just, it's wonderful that you can formalize that role a bit, and especially you being the first person that you get to really help shape it. And I think that's exciting. And I remember um, one of my first formal roles in a teaching was with you in the new grad residency program, much like when I was um, kind of in that transition um, professionally, just like Dolly is, you know, moving from bedside more into teaching, but still at the bedside. And um, I was able to have that inaugural role as a clinical coach, and you helped shape that and shape me in being able to um, define that role. And it was very exciting. Oh, that's wonderful. And in that vein, and this may come up again later, but, but um, a wonderful mentor, Dr. Trish Morton, helped me many years ago um, help us find, she calls finding it, finding your ex. And she just continues to say, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? But, you know, think more, think more. And what do you want to be the best at in this mm -hmm. school or the city or the state or the world? Um, what's your ex and trying to figure out what the ex is and then moving toward it is super exciting. And I, maybe that was the beginning of your, your pathway to your ex, Michelle, because, uh, it's worked out it, well. Yeah. It, it really is. It really was. And, um, but when you say X, it makes me think of algebra. And then I start to sweat. <laughs> like, now I've got to do like algebraic equation and I, I get a little uncomfy. <laughs> well, can you share with us a little bit about how you might be partnering? What are some things that you, the two of you, because I've heard, you know, little things here and there that you, you do together. So how might you be reaching out? I think a lot of what we do is kind of an informal partnership, testing the waters with each other and just talking about nursing and what we're doing and what's next, what's on the horizon. But I think more formally, um, my mom actually helps uh, kind of guide me through the process of giving a presentation at a regional conference a few years ago. And that was really exciting. Um, I do, I think, I think most of what we do is informal, but it's been really fun to do things here and there, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we bit. talk a lot and Dolly and I love that we can start in the middle of a story, right? We don't have to give all the background to a nursing story. We can just call <laughs> each other and say, guess what happened today and we can start in the middle and we understand and it's just it's a beautiful thing at least from my perspective but absolutely Dolly's been helping me for since she was probably five or six listening to hundreds if not millions of powerpoints and <laughs> ideas and things and giving me phenomenal feedback you know too deep too superficial i'm lost um so what those kinds of very honest and helpful feedback so um, I take that all into consideration to make what I'm doing more relevant. And so Dolly, thank you for that. <laughs> You've been yeah, helping. hopefully in my teen years, I wasn't too, uh, too mean about it. But. <laughs> That's what we call context, Dolly. That's just context. <laughs> I love that generationally too. Um, I know uh, I'm raising some Gen Zs at home and they give some really good generationally relevant feedback. We'll just call it that. It's good. It keeps me... <laughs> Keeps me smart, keeps me fresh. Yeah, mm -hmm. I call it data mining, right? I'm just data mining as I'm listening to, to Dolly and her friends. It's super helpful. So, <laughs> you know, when I when I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you, Dolly and Susan, what I think is so special about this not only is this the generational and and the mom and the daughter, but also it speaks the important I think ingredient of mentorship, which is trust mm -hmm. um, and rapport. And we talk a lot about mentorship and nursing education and nursing practice, whether which side of the bridge we're on. And as much as we talk about it, I still think we have a lot of growth to do it well. And so not everybody gets the benefit of having this close human to shepherd them through the process, whether they're on the academic or the practice side or trying to bridge them. 
And yet we should all have, and I shouldn't say should, Michelle is on a great path with me to eliminate the word should from my vocabulary. So <laughs> lecture and should are now on this list of eliminating the, the, the that from my vocabulary. But <laughs> everyone needs, I think, someone that's trust close to close trusted human to shepherd them and many of them, right? Because we can't be all things to all people. So I'm curious from your experience with each other, what nods can we take from what you all have learned about create this trust and the rapport that we could bring to our professional mentoring or relationships where it's not between generations of a family member or a close mm -hmm. trusted human. That is a really long mm -hmm. thought. Um, how's that land on you? Go ahead, Mold. Yeah, it's vital. I mean, trust is trust is everything, right? We can't grow if we can't trust the situation that we're in. And Rachel, I think you're a thousand percent right. Um, I try, I try to to I'll use Dolly as an example. I try to help her learn by I call it the wisdom of my mistakes, right? But it's not about me. It's about Dolly or whoever I'm working with. So helping them understand that conversations will come up or I might not agree with your idea or you might have to change course a little bit. It's, it's, it's only because of respect and trust. And I can't, I cannot emphasize those enough. You know, it's not about competition. It's not about learning the hard way. It's, it's just about trust and respect. Yeah. And I do think that might get lost sometimes because academia is a competitive place and practice is too. And time is short and emotions are high. And, um, but it has to come back to that. I like what you're saying, Susan, too, about making sure it's really about, and you know, it, when you're describing your relationship with Dolly, it's about Dolly, you know, her needs, where she is right now. While you might be <clears throat> drawing from your experiences, it still needs to apply to the person that you're mentoring yeah. or talking to. It has to be relevant for them. You can't just say, well, I would do this, or you should, that dirty okay. word, you should do this, right? But like, just meeting people where they are, I think, yeah. um, is helpful, important. Dolly, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective on, um, I have also been on the receiving end of your mom's mentorship, um, and it has uh, been career shaping and, and transformational for me. So I'm curious, I can only imagine the mentorship experience you've had with her. And I'm curious to hear from you, what have you taken from that and how are you applying that to the mentoring relationships that you are trying to create in your spaces? Yeah, lucky me. Um, <laughs> I agree, lucky you. <laughs> lucky me. Um, I think, I mean, her advice and guidance has been invaluable in every aspect of my life, but particularly professionally, she's been able to introduce me to so many people doing incredible work, um, which I think is invaluable always. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, I am not a particularly decisive person as she can attest. <laughs> so finding my ex has looked a little bit like finding my PQRST, you know, and on and on. Um, so having that, having someone who really knows your field and is able to um, give you the freedom and knowledge to explore everything for me from public policy to academia to bedside to you know all of those things has been great and then for my own mentorship um, and mentoring others which I'm finally transitioning into a little bit has been exciting um, I think I've been part of a couple professional mentorship programs in, that kind of fizzle out a little bit. Um, and I think that what you said, Dr. Ronello, is is totally true. It's just, it needs to be based on mutual trust and respect. And I think what I um, have started to do a little bit and what I have um, tried to guide new nurses that I work with is to find that person that you respect, that you look up to, that you love their practice, if they're a year ahead of you, two years ahead of you, 10 years ahead of you, and say, hi, um, can we get coffee? Can I ask you about this? Do you have 25 minutes to chat with me next Tuesday um, about what I want to do next? And usually people like being asked. So I think 
a little bit more onus on on uh, a mentee is is maybe key for a successful relationship professionally. I so appreciate you sharing that, Dolly. And I think you're onto something really important because when I think about the times that I've been involved in mentorship programs, um, whether I'm in it as a recipient or participant in that, or I'm part of the team building the mentoring program, a lot of times it's, okay, here's your mentor. Here's your mentee. Get to know each other. And I think we need to radically shift that paradigm. Exactly what you're talking about, Dolly, because um, how do we help the mentees and the mentors find and connect um, on a way that helps them identify people who have the lived experiences that will help shape them, that can develop the trust, the rapport, the respect. Susan, I see you like nodding up and down. Um, your thoughts on that? And and how, especially in your role, you're involved a lot in mentorship and mentoring. And what are your thoughts on our current paradigm of how we structure mentoring and where we could go to improve it? Yep. I, I can't agree enough that you know, it's it's easy to say it's bi-directional, it's a two-way street. We know that, but how to make that happen, how to infuse that, give that a dose of energy every, you know, two weeks, one month, six weeks, whatever that structure is. So the structure is important. Of course, the process is important. Keeping your eye on the goal is important, but intentionally, you know, putting some milestones in there, maybe some key questions, maybe some deliverables along the way, something like that for both people. Because Dolly, I think you're right. There's that that wonderful energy. And then um, if, if there's a disagreement or a tough spot, that does te- seem to fizzle, especially if it's optional or too mm-hmm. organic. I think it needs, um, we need to dose it a little bit uh, along the way. Yeah. I think the one thing that Dolly said that is important I heard you say, Dolly, that one thing that your your mom has done for you is to connect you with many people. Um, you know, say you're working on a public policy paper for grad school, and you know, Susan can connect you to a public policy person, and 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 so on and so on, depending on what initiative or project you're working on, or what questions you might have, or what letter of the alphabet you're trying to figure out, and but those connections and those people, that's where I think sometimes that mentorship, that more of that organic mentorship can initially happen. But then of course, if it's put within that structure of, of having some guidelines and some follow-up and some frequent um, frequency, that can be really helpful. But I think building that network where you can find those folks um, that you can reach out to is really yeah. helpful. Um, kind of keeping good company, right? I mean, yeah. the more good company you keep, the more good conversation you're going to have. And um, I don't know, I think the more can fall into place there too. <clears throat> and yeah. I, think, I think some mentoring humility, because Michelle, sometimes you realize I'm not your best person, but you know who is, <laughs> right? And making that connection. And it's not like an off you go connection. It's a, let me know what you discover and come back and share with me connection. But having the humility to do that is important. No, that's great. That makes me think of when students would come to me about needing help in dosage calculation. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not me, but I know someone who can. And her name is Dr. Rachel Nello. Her right. office is right over there and she can help you in a hot minute. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, Susan, you said something a moment ago about the competitiveness yeah. of the profession. And it made me think back to, and Michelle and I talk about Simon Sinek and and Brene Brown all the time, but so I don't know if you've heard their recent podcast. They got on this um, uh, idea of all three of them just jumping on each of their podcasts. So I don't know which podcast it fell under, but it was one of their three podcasts. Adam Grant, Simon Sinek, Brene Brown got on talking, and they were talking about how when we think about um, developing our people and how we evaluate their performance. For the most part in industries, the evaluation process is about individualism, not teamwork. Hmm. So now I'm going to say something spicy. You all know I like to put some spice <laughs> into the conversation. So I might turn up the heat uh, on this because this may land for some folks in, in different ways. But when I heard that and thought about that, and then in the context of this conversation, I think it also is pertinent to when we think about shaping and reshifting our paradigm on mentorship. Because if we are rewarding and evaluating people on individualism 
Mm -hmm. And then teamwork efforts, I think it can make an impetus. It's it's not an impetus, right? It it puts a barrier to really genuine, authentic mentoring Mm -hmm. that helps the mentee. Because I can think of situations where a mentor, um, driven by the individualism of evaluation methodologies Mm -hmm. of their performance, may shape the mentoring or their involvement Mm -hmm. um, based on that rather than the best interest of the mentee. Mm -hmm. I think there's some connection there. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I think, I think you're right. I think there's there's some reality in there. So let's just make an example, simple example. If the mentee if the mentor thinks the mentee should write an article, there's that should word again, right? So push, 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 push. And who actually ends up doing the writing and what's the goal and what did the mentee get out of the process? I don't know if that stays true along the way or if it's just so outcome driven that the, the learning is, is kind of mm, skipped, if you will. Um, but it, one thing I've noticed in academia, and this is maybe an example a little bit different, but um, the idea of collaborative testing and collaborative quizzing. So the students work together, right, uh, towards a goal, and that's part of their grade anyways. And so they all contribute and learn to work together so that hopefully the competition, at least within the group, is a little less. Maybe among the groups, it's high. But we've seen some nice kind of anecdotal results with trying some of those things out. Um, in the academic setting. So um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there, but there's huge value in kind of turning down the competition a little bit and focusing on the learning and the growth. Yeah, that's interesting to think about how to kind of evaluate a mentor-mentee relationship as a team or um, I don't know, that's, it sounds like there's things to dig into there, but I don't know that I have that solution just yet. But I'm scrolling for that podcast as soon as we're done. I want to hear yeah. it. <laughs> it, it. It's interesting. It got me thinking about just in terms of, an, and I'm not going to pull us away from our mentoring focus, but in academia of how we, um, when we think about our annual evals yes. and how we're evaluated mm-hmm. on our performance is um, what are we measuring? Are we measuring individualism um, solely or are we also measuring things that help really build teamwork and help us mm-hmm. bring in the next generation to build them up um, and really think about succession planning and um, the team and the culture mm-hmm. rather than the just, just the individual. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting that you say that. Actually, at my work, we've been um, kind of playing with the idea of group mentoring. And so it's it is much less focused on one-on-one conversation and, and guidance, um, but it's, the goal is to help um, with retention, obviously, but also with you know, decreasing burnout, with um, really creating a culture of community. Um, so it's, 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 it doesn't feel quite like the mentoring we're talking about, but it certainly, um, I think, has helped a lot of our new grad nurses um, and they are spending time with people a few years ahead of them or a few steps ahead of them in practice. So I think, you know, there's something there for sure. I I was just thinking, I'm glad you said that Dolly, because I was just thinking in practice, I'm like, that happens too in practice. As a nurse, you're often evaluated with your your own individual um, Mm -hmm. performance, uh, but there's so much of what we do is not individual, it's interprofessional, it's intraprofessional. Um, and so this idea of this shifting or including, maybe not just moving completely away from that, but yeah. including some of this group mentorship, because when you're speaking to a group, that one person that pipes up and asks that really, that question that's been bugging them, and then everybody else had that same question, yeah. you know, so now you can have this conversation, this more meta conversation about the experience or the thing, whatever is running for the group or for that one brave person that spoke up, but now you're covering a lot more ground. Mm -hmm. And now you're creating that trust to be like, oh, he spoke up so I can speak up. And this this space was held for that. And so I just, those are my reflections hearing what you were saying, Dolly. I think that can be really helpful if it's done well and you've got someone who can hold the space for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I can tell you, 
at, I was able to see some wonderful leaders um, at University of Maryland Medical Center um, really hold space for nurses to speak up and to share what was happening in a group setting. And you can tell that they felt empowered to do that because they were respected and there was like, a, really it was kind of a form of mentorship, you know, and leadership and role modeling. So I think that's great. I yeah. appreciate that. I also too the, think there's an element of mentoring that is perhaps maybe underemphasized or underrecognized, which is the indirect mentoring that happens when you may not be in a direct rela mentoring relationship with that person, but you see their work, you follow their work from a distance, yeah. and they serve as a role model and a mentor for you in that capacity. And I think recognizing that is a valid form of maybe mentorship at a distance. I don't know what that term would be, but I think helping us emphasize that and see that helps our faculty and our clinical practice partners realize how important dissemination is and mm -hmm. to get their ideas out there and to serve as a role model and recognize that when we are disseminating and we're, we're putting our work in and different aspects on a platform that there is impact for others that can serve in a mentoring role. Mm -hmm. Rachel, just this morning, I read an article of, in Nursing Education Perspective and I noticed a friend's name and I wrote to her and I said, congratulations on your lovely article. It's, it's going to help me with my work. Thank you. And she wrote back and said, actually, I was dissertation chair. This was my student. I'll pass this great news on to them. Oh. And so just, just, just that little tiny circle and that circle will grow. But that's exactly, um, exactly what we should be doing. And so that, that, that PhD student, you know, I hope that that was, that landed nicely on them this morning too, knowing that their work's being read and being being used. So, yeah, and it, I keep coming back to this when in, when I'm and in this conversation, what keeps running for me is this paradigm shift. And I know I'm guilty of this. I how often do I think of disseminating as I got to hit my yeah my scholarly productivity right? I got to hit this and that to get this disseminated. But shifting this thinking of how is this really serving to perhaps mentor at a distance or perhaps really just like it did in that exact example for you, Susan, is it sparked something that then leads to more sparks um, or a little kindling of a fire maybe, but that's right. So cheer, cheering for each other, challenging, you know, and then I say, can't wait, can't wait for the next one, you know, <laughs> meaning like keep up your good work. You know, I, someone's listening, someone cares, you know? Yeah. That's a strong reframe for me right now, like actively happening with my scholarship, because I know I've worked with Susan on this and through my DNP work, and you just feel like sometimes the act of scholarship can feel a little heavy, a little mm -hmm. hard, um, a little, cha you know, challenging, but to reframe it to be like, I, you know, I want to get this information out in hopes that somebody can get something, you know, like you said, a spark. Uh, yeah you know, it can help them in their work or it can help, you know, help them in just their, their everyday work, not only their scholarship, but just maybe they're trying to get over a little hurdle in their course or in their program. And um, you just never know. So I don't think of scholarship in that way. So now I can think of it as maybe a, a piece of, a shiny piece of mentoring from a distance. Yeah, that exactly. Call it. And, <laughs> and for someone to write and say, I put your paper as a reference in my course, it's like, well, that's nice. That's great to hear. You know, just little things like that so we can kindle each other, I think, is just, just part of our responsibility. And part, it's a fun thing to do, too. You and know? it comes back to this reframe from individualism to team work, yeah. right? To yeah. the team. It doesn't have to necessarily be the person that's four doors down from you at your institution. Right. There's a larger team at play here. Right. I like it. So we've been um, talking about professionally, you know, where everybody is. And um, I'd like to know a little bit about maybe where you're going. So um, what we talked about, what is filling your cup right now? What might be, what might you be filling your cup with in the next couple of years, you know, looking down the road? Because I think that's a big part of mentorship is to not only help someone where they are in the moment, but help them lift up their head, their gaze, just yes. enough to be able to see a little bit ahead. Um, and I know, Susan, you have helped me um, personally and professionally with that as well. So what what's on your horizons if you're able to look up that far? Mm. 
mine. Do you want to start with me? Um, yeah. This was a this was a good reflection question for me. Very good. And I, I was thinking like, how did I get here? And and I always say I got here one conversation, one phone call, one email, one meeting at a time, right? One step at a time. Even though the X is way in front of me, one little build, one little sidewalk block at a time is how you get here. So I think what's next is to keep doing that. But I think what I'd love to be able to influence is that this faculty shortage, I think, is is huge on my mind and on my heart. And it's it's here. It's ongoing. It's 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 here to stay for the moment. So anything I can do to help people fall in love with being a nurse educator, either in practice setting for nursing professional development or in the academic setting, um, I, I hope to do that. Whether it's in front of the scenes or behind the scenes, but um, that's my that's my drive right now. That's where that's where I'd like to put my um, skills, KSAs, network to good use and, and to help impact the faculty shortage. So that's my goal. Um, mm, I love that. Susan, are you gonna be up for a third conversation where we could talk about falling in love with nursing education? Yes, absolutely. Already have the title, see? <laughs> yes, we might need we might need uh, two hours for that one, but okay. yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, that sounds like a long conversation. <laughs> yes. And and watching watching Dolly do that is just like, the thr it's the thrill of my life. And uh, so that that's what I, that's where I want to put my efforts, um, both uh, upcoming faculty and faculty who are yet to develop to the next level, whatever that is. So that's what I, that's my goal. That's my dream. Oh, we are so lucky to have you. And <laughs> I don't know. I mean, wa watching my mom work and be in her element is just so inspiring. She handles it with grace and ease and makes everything look super easy. So um, that's, that's really wonderful. Um, as far as me, <laughs> um, I am in grad school right now to be a family nurse practitioner. So um, I have really loved my growth and learning and experience in the ICU, but I'm really looking forward to uh, something that I've missed for the last couple of years, which is just really educating patients and families and partnering with them really well to help manage their health at home. Um, I'm looking forward to to being able to do that again. So maybe it's similarly one conversation at a time, but um, I'm looking forward to that. It's beautiful. And you know, that, um, that love of teaching Dolly that you have, um, it shows up, right? With your patients, with your patients' families in communities, um, with students, learners, um, mentees, it can show up in all these little nooks and crannies. So um, I look forward to you growing in that role uh, with your graduate work and reaching people in that way and uh, really activating your love of teaching in that way. Because yeah. that that's, enough. well, yeah, we can talk, we're going to have a whole <laughs> year of talking about love of teaching because um, I think th there's a lot that mm -hmm. we could bolster um, patient care, right? Sounds like season I, four theme. Season four. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I've been looking. I've been looking for a theme. So done. 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 Love it. Love <laughs> it. It's everything. Yeah. Well, Dolly, Susan, thank you so much for uh, taking your time to share with us your experiences and mentoring and sharing with us you. Um, thank you. I'll leave it at that because I don't have the words to actually communicate and articulate exactly what um, your influence, both seeing both of you together and the, that relationship and Susan, your influence on those you've touched, uh, Michelle and I included, um, there's not a way to articulate other than thank you. Oh. So thanks for being here. Oh, thanks. thanks for having us. Thank you. What a treat. Thanks for having us. Thank you for joining us on this episode of NLN Nursing Edge Unscripted Surface. We hope you join us next time. Until then, remember, whether your water is calm or choppy, stay connected, get vulnerable, and dare to go beneath the surface.